All right, good morning. I guess the, the lights are going down, the microphone's on, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you all so much for uh, coming out at 9 a.m. on a bright and sunny Saturday morning. Um, but uh, I think if you've been here for, for part of the uh, first two days, um, it's just been a very special time for us all to spend together. So uh, we're going to continue that uh, through today. Uh, I'm Elliot Knight, the Executive Director of the Alabama State Council on the Arts, and we'll be uh, facilitating our discussion this morning. Uh, please go ahead and uh, silence your cell phones or other devices that may make noise uh, during the, the next hour. And um, uh, what we're going to do is a little bit of a hybrid uh, panel uh, in that uh, each of our three uh, panelists are going to have uh, about a 10 or 12 minute uh, mini presentation. Uh, then towards the end, we'll kind of revert back into more of a panel format. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this uh, whole program and weekend is, is really uh, ambitious in that we're covering a lot of ground in a short period of time and packing a lot of content in. So uh, hopefully everybody's sufficiently caffeinated and we'll, we'll move quickly this morning uh, to try to cover as much ground um, as we can. And I'm going to try to um, wonder, uh, figure out how the clicker um, works and uh, do that. All right. Well, <clears throat> um, well, I'll, you know, while we're, we're sorting out some visuals, I'll uh, go ahead and say a few things. Um, but, uh, you know, as we have had discussions thinking about this, you know, public art um, can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And, um, you know, uh, and I think we're going to kind of pull at some of that today and think about how uh, public art has, has changed over time um, and, um, and some kind of examples of, of things now that are um, not always made to be permanent and everlasting. And, um, you know that, um, but uh, the public in that can can also mean quite a few things. In that, uh, um, you know, it can be the um, funding that was used to uh, create a piece of art, um, but also the um, place where um, it is situated. Uh, and a lot of people we think of that as outside being in the public, but um, also as we've seen through some examples, um, you know, of uh, post offices, public buildings, a lot of people are familiar with the federal uh, percent for art of capital expenditures. Now a lot of federal courthouses have public art. Um, and so uh, inside of public uh, accessible buildings, um, outside of course, um, but that um, has kind of evolved and changed in the purposes and, and, and ways that people have um, been using public art. So um, we, looks like we are good and we'll, Jump right in. Uh, since we're in Montgomery, I wanted to kind of start with an a, uh, early example of, of what uh, you could think about a public art here in Montgomery, the Court Square Fountain um, that was uh, installed in 1885. Uh, on the left, you know, this was a long-standing spring that had been there for a long time. And uh, instead of just, um, you know, making it more of a, a pump and a well, there was a utilitarian thing. It was very much a decorative, um, but this is, uh, you know, harkening back to classical Greek um, sculpture. And, uh, but this was a, um, not necessarily a site-specific piece. It was ordered from a catalog from a foundry in New York, and I believe that Bowling Green, Kentucky, and Memphis also have um, identical fountains. But uh, the kind of aspirational um, thing of a, of a young uh, town, of, of putting something right in the, in the center there that was uh, um, decorative and beautiful, uh, but also uh, functioned. Um, Vulcan, uh, which was created for the 1904 um, St. Louis World's Fair uh, by Giuseppe Moretti, uh, the largest cast iron statue in the world. We heard a lot about um, art and industry yesterday and Birmingham's, um, you know, uh, becoming the magic city uh, through, through that industry. And this was a way to show off the uh, industrial uh, prowess and materials of that place. Um, and this was a, a stereo card made at the time, but you know, Vulcan is one that persists as we still get to enjoy uh, in Birmingham. Someone had alluded to uh, Roderick McKenzie uh, already. These are the Capitol Domes that uh, he created in uh, 1926. Um, but again, you know, kind of telling stories about um, the, the history of the place where these were, were put. That um, and uh, and those also you can still go and see in the state capitol uh, dome. Um, an interesting one uh, in Enterprise that uh, was erected in uh, 1919, and um, and I believe is. Uh, the only um, monument erected to an agricultural pest in the world. So uh, we, uh, we have that. This was not the original. I think this has been uh, stolen a number of times and rebuilt, and, uh, but that's, that's more of uh, what it looks like today if you're, you're down at Enterprise. Um, 
Any of you who've gone through uh, Dothan know about the murals down there that have now extended beyond Dothan into uh, other cities in the Wiregrass, but again, you know, celebrating uh, uh, particular people and, and, and events of the, the history of that place being depicted um, uh, and, and paint on, on walls. And, uh, um, and back to Birmingham, um, getting a little more contemporary into 1991, um, Frank Fleming's The Storyteller um, Fountain at Five Point South. Um, so again, um, kind of um, more, more permanent uh, bronze sculpture, but very different than some of the kind of more um, statuary and, and monuments of, of before. Um, and uh, this one cheats a little bit. This was actually uh, in Lake City, South Carolina, uh, this year at Art Fields, but this is an Alabama artist, uh, Deborah Riff. And so this, uh, getting a little bit more into thinking about ephemeral or temporary public art. This was originally a linoleum uh, relief uh, print uh, that was digitally uh, reproduced and then wheat pasted onto um, a barn. So uh, maybe a year lifespan, um, thinking about that instead of something that would be um, indefinitely installed. So, um, so I guess with that, just kind of to frame a little bit of the um, brief history and then Dennis uh, Harper, uh, we'll, we'll kind of um, cover a little bit of um, uh, more WPA era uh, with, with particular uh, thing. But Dennis Harper, uh, Joel Collins Smith, uh, Museum of Fine Arts at Auburn University uh, curator uh, will be our first panelist to speak. And then uh, Cynthia Kirana, uh, who's a multidisciplinary artist based here in Montgomery, uh, but, uh, who founded uh, Expose Art and co-founded Montgomery Art Project, will go next. And then Deborah Velders, uh, the director of the Mobile Museum of Art um, down in Mobile, will be our third panelist to speak. And then we will uh, kind of get back together for, for some more um, discussion and then open it up for questions uh, towards the end. So um, with that, uh, Dennis. Um. Well, Elliot mentioned we have the only monument to an agricultural past, but I know that we certainly have monuments to political and governmental pests <laughs> <laughs> throughout the nation and not just in Alabama. So uh, thank you, Elliot, and thank you all attendees for, following, uh, for joining us this morning. Leading up to this symposium, my colleagues and I uh, talked over some broad themes about our topic. We each noted common perception, or perhaps misperception, as Elliot alluded to, of the idea that public art is often equated with something that is long-lasting, uh, with monuments, grandiose statuaries, uh, and often boll weevils. Um, but as we reminded ourselves, the word public is not synonymous with eternal or, or even stupendous. It derives from the Latin populus and publicus uh, and means of the people, open to general observation and encompasses other definitions including common and vulgar. Perhaps by coincidence, uh, my panelists and I found that we were all interested in discussing forms of art that were uh, not intended for long-term use, but instead were temporary or ephemeral as they were public in nature. So for my part, I want to look to a period of American history that was rich in producing great examples of permanent public art, uh, such as mural paintings. And I refer to the years between the Great Depression and World War II, when, when artists supported by the FAP, whoops, this is a little, little too soon, let's go back, that's okay. Um, executed numerous public murals across the country for post offices, governmental lobbies, civic sites, and other similar, similar edifices open to general observation. The example I present today, however, was created to reach a slightly different audience uh, than visitors to those sorts of formal spaces, the State Fair, which perhaps touched more on the common, if not vulgar, aspects of publicus. So if you'll allow me to set the stage briefly um, on which this production occurred and the general time. It was the early months of 1939, and frankly, the world was in dire straits. Nazi Germany moved to occupy portions of Eastern Europe. Italy invaded Albania. Japan and Britain edged towards war. A second world war was ramping up very quickly. Unrelated to military conflict, an earthquake in Chile killed 30,000 people. Here at home, America was still reeling from the great economic crash. 
racial bigotry, birth lynchings, and other forms of violent terrorism. Three severe droughts devastated agriculture in our, in our heartland. Amid such troubling times, communities both large and small were searching for ways to lift their people's spirits out of such despair. Now we can have <laughs> the World's Fair. So one of the grandest, perhaps, of these uplifting, distracting projects was certainly the New York World's Fair, which focused on the world of tomorrow and projected a carefree future. In Alabama, as in other non-cosmopolitan locations, the annual state fair offered similar, albeit more homespun, opportunities. Now we can go. Recognizing a profound collective need of diversion, coupled with a desire to promote the state's accomplishments, Alabama State Fair officials planned to make their 1939 state fair its most impressive yet. Oversight of the fair's agricultural exhibits that year was assigned to Posey Oliver Davis, director of Alabama's Extension Service based at Alabama Polytechnic Institute, now Auburn University. A former public school teacher, horticulturalist, editor, pioneering radio broadcaster, P.O. Davis was a tireless advocate for the rural South, especially Alabama, and an innovator in finding ways to spread the extension's message. His plan for the fair exhibit was radical compared to the usual displays such as this, of farm tools, livestock, superlative crops. He took a cue from FDR's uh, New Deal programs for the arts and commissioned a mural painter to create in grand scale a historical panorama of Alabama agriculture to serve as the featured uh, objects in the exhibit. Davis and his colleagues at API solicited help from the state director of the FAP, a division of the um, Works Progress Administration, to identify an artist who would be appropriate for the commission. They chose John Augustus Walker, a Mobile native who had experience with murals. Walker here. In fact, he had uh, engaged in another form of public art. On the left side, you can see him making a design for Mardi Gras floats. Walker had previously produced a series of large oil paintings for the Southern Market, Old City Hall in Mobile, depicting the city's history and vibrant compositions. Now, you can flip to that. Uh, these are just three details of a large spread, which are still extant and available to, uh, to view in the building's current use as the Mobile Muse uh, Museum of Mobile. Walker began planning the project with Davis mid-March 1939, roughly six months before the exhibit needed to be installed on the Birmingham fairgrounds. He began compositional studies right away, which progressed quickly to a couple of canvases. Let's show one there. Uh, but progress soon slowed as the back and forth exchange between the artist and a committee of agricultural academics and extension officers bogged down. As reflected in correspondence that still preserved in Auburn's archives and special collections, it wasn't just a matter of trying to ensure historical accuracy in the images Walker created, a challenge perhaps not completely overcome in this image, uh, TPs in the background. Uh, no, many of the problems that Walker faced were simply due to the visual impractical, visually impractical nature of some of the ideas of the extension committee. I think it would have been difficult for even Michelangelo to <laughs> translate them into a successful composition. Time was running out. Months were passing with back and forth between uh, long distance communications from Mobile up to Auburn. Walker grew frustrated, and uh, eventually the group settled on a smaller number of subjects for a smaller number of paintings. But to compensate for that reduction, Walker devised a dramatic scheme uh, to, uh, to install these 10 paintings now in, within the fairgrounds pavilion. Unfortunately, we don't have any photographs to show, so let me just sort of lay it out uh, uh, in words. Among other details, his design involves stretching fabric, drapery, vertically between each of the paintings, and fluted to resemble uh, fluted columns with pleats. 
and he had bunting that would be suspended across the ceiling of the pavilion, across and hiding the open uh, beams, gathered like bows in the center, draping down uh, that ran throughout the entire room. Um, it, like I said, there are no, there's some very few and sort of faded drawings that illustrate what he was talking about and the receipts for the fabric. So it, we know it was done, but uh, we can only imagine it. And in my mind's eye, it seems like a David Lynch production, uh, red velvet uh, and uh, mysterious. Now, in order to finish in time, um, Walker had to hire an assistant to help him with the paintings. A another m mobile artist, Richbourg Gaillard Jr., to assist him with the paintings. And by late September, the project was finally finished and uh, ready for the grand opening on Monday, October 2nd. So, Elliot, maybe you could roll through a few of the slides just in uh, pause for a minute or two within each. By all accounts, the Alabama's um, 1939 State Fair was a jubilant success. Crowds streamed throughout the week, and they couldn't help but notice the vivid painting exhibition that acknowledged the state's past and celebrated its bright future made possible through the accompli accomplishments of farming technology. The 10 scenes transported visitors through time. From witnessing the earliest native resident who plowed a field while bearing an infant across her shoulders, her good-for-nothing uh, male counterpart carried a, a carrion across in the background while she toiled, uh, all the way up to the arrival of Europeans importing cattle and swine along with forged steel, past frontier and plantation farming practices, to modern crop diversification. So let, let's go forward a few. Um, and all, all the way up to the rewards that were wrought by electrification, machination, refrigeration, and high-speed communication. So let's pull forward one more. This is my favorite image with a, a cornucopia spilling down the goods of modern society uh, as celebrated at the Cooperative Extension and bringing a new, uh, new future to America. They made one more slide, which we can pull forward to, where Walker tried to fit in some of the abandoned themes uh, back into the general scheme. So it opened on a Monday. The following Saturday, October 7th, the fair ended, and the exhibition was dismantled. The paintings were brought back to Auburn and all but forgotten for several decades. There's a longer story to tell uh, what has happened since then, but that we'll save for another occasion. As part of our celebration of Alabama's artistic heritage during the bicentennial, I thought it would be worthwhile to shine a light on one example among many um, that are equally interesting but relatively unknown to the general public. With small material costs and a remarkable willingness to divide uh, conventions, J.A. Walker and P.O. Davis, uh, Davis's public extravaganza accomplished a feat of no small value for its time. And it provides an example worth emulating today. As the truest part public art does, it pulled itself out of the rarefied gallery chamber and into the communal or public spaces where regular people live their lives. And whether or not that work was intended to endure physically, it often does in so many other ways. Speaking for the museum profession, it seems we are continually working for ways, searching for ways to engage new audiences. One of the most obvious answers is found in this historical panorama. Go out where the people are, even if only for a week. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dennis. Sentiment. Wow, thank you, Dennis, for that insightful presentation. And I also would like to thank Elliot and MMFA for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful symposium and being surrounded by um, wonderful company. So today, I'd like to share with you um, my project. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? 
<laughs> so today I'd like to share with you um, my projects in turning private spaces into public um, by reforming and representing uh, and reconnecting community through arts in public spaces and happenings. Um, so the concept of public art, again, um, has undergo radical changes. It moved beyond uh, memorializing a certain historical figure and certain time in history. So today, public arts may be impermanent and it may also be participatory based, more democratic in a way you can say. Um, when we discuss public art, we must also discuss the importance of space. A public artwork become first an object in public space, and as the art reform um, the public space, we are left with its social and um, economic impact. And space itself is a social construction that is always under production. Um, space itself is never fixed. It is continually being reformed by its inhabitants and the politics surrounding it. So close to four years ago, I moved back to Montgomery, Alabama. I was really determined to, try to find my tribe. So what I did was uh, I turned my house into an alternative art space and artist residency. Okay. Um, so here I invited visiting artists from outside of Alabama to visit um, Montgomery to learn about our city and give dialogues and um, workshops and talks to the community. So we've hosted outdoor installations, such as the picture above, and also the um, workshops and uh, exhibition indoor. Um, there's also many other forms of um, expression that we do. You can click the next one. Okay. Um, such as readings, um, performances, and things like this. So about a year ago, I, I opened a second art house and this particular location serve as a um, creative uh, co-working space. And what we do is we provide, I'll go back please. <laughs> we provide a temporary um, studio spaces for artists who um, would like to do more research uh, about our city. Um, we provide uh, exhibition spaces and exhibition opportunities with our arts partners, such as Cresson Dexter and um, Low Mill in Huntsville. So with this, um, you can click on the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this, this project really made me think about art in a such different way. Um, it changed, it changed the, the role of public art and a more socially engaging art projects for me. So I started to create happenings um, and it's mostly hosted at the art houses. So these are pretty much grassroots um, projects that we are working on. Uh, one of the happenings that we did, it's called New Montgomery. You can click on that. So uh, New Montgomery Cocktail Challenge. And um, I figured it was a good way to get people together. <laughs> um, but really, the New Montgomery Cocktail Challenge was developed out of frustration in a way. Uh, last year, uh, a group of friends and I went to dinner, and on the menu, on the drinks menu, it says Old Montgomery Cocktail. And, uh, and, uh, exactly. So, so, of course, we vented and um, we, <laughs> We vented over the word Old Montgomery and the um, historical implication that Old Montgomery has. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to depict a more accurate portraits of Montgomery um, today from the perspective of the locals and expats. So, so I've invited, oh, go back please, yeah, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so I invited a couple of friends and, um, and the challenge is to create a cocktail that represent Montgomery in their world. Um, so any hopes, any criticism, anything. Um, but you must come with a backstory. And, um, and then I, ho I hope to bring this into a book format and um, publish it one day. 
The other um, happenings that we do is called The Last Supper, where I invited a group of people who might not otherwise share supper together. And maybe that is their last supper, <laughs> who knows? But um, again, after the, the um, happenings, we documented the process and we exchanged the stories and things like this and documented the stories. Um, uh, you, we, can, we can change. So there is uh, this new genre of public art is oftentimes participatory and impermanent. Sometimes it doesn't have an actual object that we can hold on to. So it's pretty much fleeting. And it's, you know, artists nowadays move to engage with um, communities and existing social struggles to develop collaboration and dialogue with residents. And since it, consider, since it is considered society and social dimension for point of observation, the project is built upon relationship between the artists, the residents, and the audience. Um, However, there are still limitations to my approach. Um, I wanted to turn placemaking into homemaking. I wanted to turn place into space. And I wanted to give people the feeling of connection and to create a more memorable experience and to give voice to the community. So with this in mind, I co-founded MAP, Montgomery Art Projects, with Sophie Spalski. She's there in the audience. <laughs> and Sarah Buller. Um, so MAP works in collaboration with Exposed Art to build critical mass impact by art installation on and around Dexter Avenue. They are compelling, uplifting, empowering, and we also hope thought-provoking. So in April, we collaborated with the French photographer uh, JR for the Inside Out project. We thought it was a great idea, thank you. <laughs> we thought it was a great idea to introduce a large scale public art installation by reintroducing our community. Um, so over the course of two weeks, we hosted multiple events all around the city uh, to take photos of people of Montgomery. Uh, next, please. So our installation was, oh, no, that's too far. Yeah. Next one. So our installation was made in the heart of downtown Montgomery uh, on One Court Square in Dexter Avenue, a place that contained layered, complex, powerful history of human struggle and redemption. It is a place where people are now returning, like myself, <laughs> to create new possibilities for themselves and for those around them. Um, next, please. So the pasting of the photographs took two days there were hundreds of photos left. So what we did is we expanded our initial plan and pasted the leftover photos in over 14 other locations on and around Dexter Avenue. Um, and JR's assistant confirmed uh, that our inside out installation was the largest since Times Square in 2013. So with over 250 countries, ours was the largest. So yay, Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this project really involved thousands of, oh, we can click on the next slide. These are the other location on and around Dexter Avenue. Um, so the in installation itself um, involved thousands of local participants with diverse cultural and socioeconomic background. You know, this project really, I, I've learned that we want to share, we have the desire to present a more accurate portrait of Montgomery from the inside. A community of individuals who are loving, intelligent, passionate, creative, and evolving together. And this project really remind us that the power to transform exists within each of us and that an engaged, loving community is a way forward. So uh, next one. And uh, this is also the um, examples of the other places that we took over. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I really looking forward to turning more private spaces into public um, to create new maps, uh, ones that guide us home, ones that forge new relationships, ones that light our way forward. Um, 
I truly believe that art is our pathway, uh, home is our canvas, and the journey, again, is the destination. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Deborah Velder from the Mobile Museum of Art. Well, I think my task is to summarize all of public art and the history of all public art in five minutes. So <laughs> we can do it. Um, so I often like to, as I approach a subject, interrogate my own assumptions, question myself and my understanding of what the task is. So as I thought about public art, I thought, well, do I really know what it is? Um, I began with the concept that there is content, there is character, there is community. But it requires actually asking the question, what is public art? What is its function or purpose? And who is it for? Whatever era we're talking about. So I turn to some, next slide, um, some very public institutions and their ideas about what public art is. The Americans for the Arts website tells us that public art reflects and reveals our society. The Forbes magazine, um, a business or, uh, organization, tells us that we need public art because it improves our quality of life. It makes us stop and open our eyes. And to so it opens our eyes to something that ignites conversation. The Association for Public Art Forum tells us that public art, this art, is there for everyone, a form of collective community expression. It tells us that public art is a reflection of how we see the world. The artist's response to our time and place combined with our own sense of who we are. Well, these are lofty ideas um, that assume that we all share those views of the world. Next slide. So we can look to history, to very public art that has been with us for a very long time. I would say, looking at that history, um, it's often about power and status. When the Athenian general Pericles deployed public money for the creation of the Parthenon, it was to consolidate his power, his base. When the great Michelangelo was commissioned to create David, it was the city of Florence, the center of the church and of great power that commissioned that work. So the commissioner of work in other times, and I would argue even in the present in public art, determines the narrative. They select the artist, they select the story, they select the site, they own it. So, so do we really have a common understanding of community and content and public art. I'm not saying that it's always a bad story, <laughs> um, but whether governments or corporations are commissioning the work, they do control the narrative, and that is put in the public realm. So next slide. Even in contemporary times, whether it's a city or a government or a corporation, through spectacle in our own time. This is still an expression of power and of prestige and of status. Many times in a very good way. Um, Anish Kapoor's work that was commissioned for Chicago is now affectionately known as the Bean. It is part of the brand of Chicago and identifies the city through its artwork. And these wonderful works, these are just a, a couple of examples, do brand a community and brand an area with a sense of creative identity. 
Next slide. So, interestingly, concurrently, there are always artists everywhere making art privately that is sometimes then transitioned into the public domain, not commissioned work, but the objects of creative expression. We know many of these examples throughout the world in Chandigarh, India, the great rock garden, Pearl Friars topiary creations in South Carolina, the um, fin Finnish uh, garden of 500 concrete figures, uh, Milkovich's beer can house in Houston, and so on. Next slide. So these are examples of works that, and graffiti art as well, everywhere, um, of art that enters the public domain that is not commissioned, that is not an expression of corporate or government power, but of creative power, of the human spirit. Next slide. And certainly this is true in the state of Alabama. Many of these environments that were created privately um, and then just impelled to be created in a public domain or shared with the public by virtue of their power, their creative power, not corporate or government or monetary power. And these are a few examples. Um, Tinglewood carvings in Montevallo in Alabama, Butch Anthony's Museum of Wonder and the drive through Museum, of course, the G's Ben Quilters, um, Joe Mentor's African Village to America. Next slide. So what distinguishes public art in our state? The qualities that define and distinguish Alabama itself, lacking the economic, corporate, or political power of some other states and nations, Alabama artists have simply utilized what they have taking existing resources, recycling the man-made, using the natural environment for their creative expression. And I'll quote um, Al Head, what Al Head said, which I thought was absolutely on the money. In all cases, public art calls attention to something that people feel is important. Alabama has an abundance of public art that reflects the unique and colorful character of the place we call home. Next slide. So in our area, my colleagues and I, Melissa Mutert, Stan Hackney and I live in, were and work in Mobile, Alabama. There are examples of both. And I say both meaning these two streams of public art that I think of as concurrent twins, really, of public art. There are the monuments like Caspar Buberl's um, portrait of Admiral Raphael Semmes, who was a naval admiral for the Confederacy. This is located right in the downtown of Mobile. And this is what Buberl himself said. Um, this very matter of fact, the statue is eight feet six inches high. The pedestal is 12 feet high, which will be cut in granite in Louisville, Kentucky, after my design. On this is a bronze panel with the ship Alabama and an inscriptive plate with the words, Raphael Semmes, Commander, CS Steamer, Alabama, and so forth. This was an expression of the greatness of this admiral during the Confederacy. It was a very public statement of Mobile's identity and the importance uh, of Mobile in the Confederacy. Next slide. Another very public work, there are several, uh, a great many actually, murals and mosaics by Conrad Albrizio. These two are expressing in a very public way, these are from 1964, they are in the Mobile Civic Center. <clears throat> They're huge. And they are expressions of something very important to Mobile, Mardi Gras. They were, uh, this is an, a, a branding of sorts of 
what Mobile is and what it values, the celebration of Mardi Gras, which has been going on for 300 years, is commissioned through this, um, this artist. And this was a commission by the city of Mobile, which obviously in the 60s and to this day identifies itself with this great um, joyful celebration that's called Mardi Gras. Next slide. Another Albrizio uh, commission was by the University of South Alabama's Medical Center in 1966. This is the story of medicine, and this has been very lovingly restored and kept in the university's um, health center. N next slide, please. So there are other commissions. Um, again, commissions, meaning that the entity commissioning the work is determining often the subject matter, the artist, the site, how much is going to be paid, and what the message is. These are uh, works that are in Jerry Moulton's Children's Park, also University of South Alabama, the Children's and Women's Hospital. There are 50 of these sculptures. Next, next slide, please. Another commission by the university. Um, this is the Bell Tower mural by uh, Jason Gines, who was then head of the art department in 2013. This took two years to complete. Uh, quite a magnificent mural, actually. Next slide, please. Then, uh, most recently, we have a federal GSA commission for uh, the new federal courthouse building in Mobile. And again, this is a government commission, but we were very, uh, as a city, very proud of this in that the GSA uh, for those of you who've served on panels with the GSA Commission, um, present a panel, a group of panelists or jurors with uh, a roster of artists that are nationally known, generally. Um, and these, the panelists are invited to present other artists. So in this case, um, rather than the figure of justice or some very conventional subject matter, the group, the panel that decided that they would like something of the character of Mobile. So they chose the Delta, the Mobile Delta, which is strongly identified a great thing uh, about Mobile. So Jason Middlebrook was one of the GSA artists who was selected, and he was invited to visit Mobile and visit the Delta. And Quite unusually, he has designed a mosaic of delta um, flora and fauna found in Mobile's delta. It's quite extraordinary for a federal courthouse, and we were very proud of it. Uh, next slide, please. But the panel also asked that there be consideration of a Mobile artist, and so the commission was actually split into. And Rain Bedsall, who was born in and raised in Mobile, but lives and works now in New Orleans, was the second artist. And she chose to create a, an exterior piece also about the Delta. Next slide, please. So throughout Mobile and the uh, Gulf Shore, there are municipal and private entity commissions of artworks by area artists. Um, for the city of Mobile, Bike Rack by Corey Swindle, um, a Kenny Scharf, who's not a Mobile artist, but it was commissioned to do this mural uh, on the side of the Alabama Contemporary Arts Center uh, building, uh, which was, by the way, quite controversial. It required city, uh, the city council to approve it. A great many letters had to be written in order to allow this. Um, oyster shells throughout that, are, that uh, ha invite artists in the area to uh, paint on them, design them, sculpt them. Uh, Casey Downing sculpture in downtown, these are just a few. There is a great deal of support for the artists in the community. This too is public art. 
And while there is some control by those commissioning the work, um, they are seeking out the local artists for the interpretations. Next slide, please. Our own Mobile Museum of Art uh, has several initiatives that are in the public domain. We have a government plaza gallery which, uh, in which we showcase area artists. We have a sculpture trail with works from the collection put outside. We have a pop-up museum for Mobile in which we feature works that are not susceptible to light or heat damage. Um, we have extended our sculpture trail far and beyond in order to further the, uh, the opportunities for area artists in our community and for the experience of art. Next slide, please. There are also, our region includes Baldwin County in the city of Fairhope, which has very strong affiliations with local artists, regional artists, from the Marietta Johnson sculpture in Fair, Fairhope Park um, that was dedicated in the 90s uh, to this great educator, 19th century educator. Bruce Larson, who lives and works in Fairhope. Um, the public library in, in Fairhope included a Dee Dee Morrison sculpture and, of course, um, the America Jones Gillespie mural that was funded by the Fairhope Educational Enrichment Fund. So there is a strong um, sense in the Gulf Shore area, in Mobile area, that public art is important, that it can go beyond the commission of governments and corporations um, to embrace the artist's expression. Next slide, please, last slide. So I would argue that there are always and have always been twin public art entities, twin motivations. They always must be about content, about character and community, but we have to question who's driving the content, whose character is the public art describing, and who is the community. I did not include a slide of this work, and technically um, it is not truly public, but I would say in Alabama, one of the greatest expressions of all three of these is at the uh, initiative of the Equal Justice Initiative's National Memorial for Peace and Justice. Um, the content is about racial terrorism and healing. The character is truth-telling, confronting our past, and the community is all of us. And it is not truly public in that you have to pay to visit but I would argue this is one of the great works of public art or in the public domain that we have in the state of Alabama. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, one of the images you just showed uh, here, I was in Fairhope a week or two ago and, and someone had uh, decorated this, so one of the kids is holding a pot of moms, and one of them has uh, Mardi Gras beads, and it, it really made me smile, and that, you know, really seeing the embrace of the public, of the public art, and the way it, uh, you know, maybe evolves over time, and they interact with it, uh, was, was really interesting to see. Um, one thing that uh, I thought about, um, as we were talking, you know, one, another category that uh, is works that were created not necessarily as temporary works, but they are cited um, temporarily in a place, um, and Dennis and the, the Jewel Collins Smith Museum has a, um, and there's a mic right there, if you, oh, you got one. Um, but the um, out of the box sculpture trail, if you would just kind of briefly tell us a little bit about um, what that is and a little bit about that model of, of, of showcasing sculpture for a community that way. I'm not certain, the, is the microphone on? Okay. Well, we inaugurated a public art uh, juried sculpture exhibition, I think about, eight years ago now. Uh, this is our fourth iteration. It's a national call for, uh, for sculptors, contemporary sculptors. Uh, in each year's iteration, I've invited uh, a nationally known uh, or sometimes internationally known artist to, there, thank you, 
to jury the exhibition. Um, they've included Bob Stackhouse, uh, Gene Shin, Willie Cole. Uh, this year we had Patrick Dougherty. Um, and it's a year-long installation. We have a fairly good-sized public grounds at the museum. And um, in a selfish way, uh, our idea was to try to increase the appetite for public art so that we could generate funds uh, somehow to buy permanent um, works of art for the collection that would grow outside of the walls of the museum and perhaps out into the community at large. So it, it has grown each year in, um, I think, the number of entries, the number of works that we've been able to select, and the number of funding, so I think we're achieving success there. Um, we have discovered that across a year in the Alabama weather, from extreme heat, high, uh, high winds, heavy rains, and sometimes freezing, that public art uh, has what we call in the museum field inherent vice. Uh, <laughs> many of it, uh, several, a few of the pieces uh, over the years have had a collaboration with nature. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But it has become something that the community has really embraced, and they look forward to it each year. Uh, we, we rotate it so that we have a year in installation on view and a year that we take a breath, but also send out submissions uh, and, and give the process a chance to, uh, to evolve. It opens in October and runs through the following October. Um, it's, uh, it's not a money maker, obviously, but it's you know, like running the subway. We think that it's an amenity that a community can use. And uh, we have been able to purchase uh, through museum funds or also through some of our patrons works that remain on campus now. Uh, one of those that does have collaboration and it was actually a kind of a traffic stopper is a, a self-portrait, a double self-portrait from uh, an artist based down in New Orleans who uh, dressed himself up in furry bunny costume with ears and uh, life size. He's floating in the middle of the pond staring at himself. Um, police stopped on the very first day of the installation and said, we got a, a report from a concerned citizen that somebody's swimming in your pond <laughs> and it's posted. Uh, no swimming, no fishing. And we had to uh, convince him that this was art. And he looked askance and then went away. Uh, it, I'd say 99% of the population loves the work, of the community loves the work. It's our best billboard. But we, we do have some visitors who in some way feel that it's, I don't know, sacrilege, uh, heretical and have refused to come to the museum, and they've told us very vocally that they don't want to do that. It's, it's interspecies loved because our pond's turtles love to climb up on the shoulders, and they do what turtles do, and so the white fur has turned brown, and each year we do have to maintain it. Anyway, I, I digress. And, and it is an own year, so if you find yourself in Auburn, uh, you can go and visit those yes. uh, this mm -hmm. year. Uh, well, we've got about five minutes left, and I, I could keep asking questions, but really would like to uh, open it up and see if, if any of you have uh, anything you'd like to post to our, to our panelists. And I think we have a microphone that can come to you if you are so inclined. Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> My question is, as I can't remember, is Janita? Cynthia, Cynthia, Cynthia. Yes. okay. What has been the biggest obstacle you have faced with the, your uh, organization doing the public art in the, in the community? Well, uh, can you hear me? Since it is uh, located in neighborhood, um, I've received some letters from, <laughs> from the city. So, so my biggest, our biggest challenge is just, again, educating people that this is a, an open space for others. Uh, even though it is in a home, it's just an alternative way to um, have a community together. So the space itself is for everyone. I think 
there is a notion of this traditional notion where home is for private, but I'm trying to, we're, we're trying to open it up where home is for everyone. Um, so that's, that's the challenge. And we, we started to look into, again, partnering with other arts organizations so we can expand our projects in the more larger context, um, which is Cress on Dexter um, in downtown Montgomery. So we utilize their community room to create larger exhibitions. Um, we still host the artists in our art houses and they still have the studio there and create there, but the larger dialogue, we try to do it elsewhere. So the public, more public can, can utilize the space. This is a question wrapped in a comment and thinking about the public and public art and how the public um, people often react strongly. And because the Storyteller Fountain in Birmingham, Frank Fleming's beautiful fountain was shown, that, it, that's a, an accession work at the Birmingham Museum of Art. And at least once a year, I get an angry letter or voicemail or sometimes now through social media from a member of the public. There's no rhyme or reason whether they're old or young, black or white, it can be anybody. Uh, who says, how dare you have this sculpture of Satan at five points, and then will send me a link to the sculpture of Bahafamet uh, that has gone up in various state capitals to make the point about religious freedom. And uh, I, even at the dedication for that sculpture, um, there was a protest. After a prayer had been said, <laughs> an invocation had been given, it broke Frank's heart. Um, any thoughts on how do, how do you bring the public along with public art without horribly diluting the vision and the intent of the artist? For me? Is this for me also? For all, for oh. hmm. Would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know well what you speak of, Graham. Um, I think people, a good, a good aspect of this is that people care. And that's often where I start when I'm responding to someone angry. Um, I'm always grateful that someone is engaged enough to bother. <laughs> I think the worst thing is just sort of apathy. Uh, but I think people do feel the need to be included in the decision making. Um, and that's why and I make the distinction that the entity paying for the work to be there has some say in its presentation, um, but it is in the public domain. Um, and I feel listening to why people feel as they do or what it is that, and you're so great at that um, anyway, but listening to people, having them, giving them a voice in what's, what this piece is about or why it's there. Um, often seems to settle things a bit, just that, uh, just wanting to be heard. Um, and I, so far, um, I feel that's probably been the most effective help for me is, and for our staff to just listen and take note. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, when we started the JR project, um, you know, we've created discussions and public meetings, so we uh, invited uh, the public to, to meet uh, JR's assistant and to really let them know what this is all about. And again, the projects, you know, we were trying to be, we, we, well, we tried to be inclusive, um, but there are still others that are um, worry about the aftermath of this project because it is, a large project with lots of paper, thousands of faces, so there are, uh, <laughs> they wanted to know how we could clean it up and how, how would we preserve the space and the city um, and things like this. So, so a plan of action after the exhibition is over is always a good idea for us to let people know. Um, but yes, trying to be, more inclusive and get the dialogue going with um, 
letting them know what it is all about and what their what their thoughts are and create that discussion. But at the same time, we cannot really please everyone, so there's always you know exchange. Um, so I'm I'm I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think we need to finish. Um, Stan, if you're dying to say something, Thank you. we will finish after you complete your thoughts. So uh, it, briefly, uh, Graham, I think the problem, of course, is magnified if art is in the public, uh, but it's the same thing that we have to deal with with art inside the museum, and that's a matter of interpretation uh, and communication with your audience members. You can't just do the field of dreams, build it, they will come and appreciate it. Um, it needs to be discussed, it needs to be, um, there needs to be a dialogue, there needs to be an education, not talking down to someone, but talking with someone about what the work of art is. And uh, then you could always canonize uh, Frank Fleming, and perhaps that could solve the problem as well. Well, thank you. <laughs>